Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to Are You In or Are You Out? In Housing in 2020 and Beyond. It's a session brought to you by Serpico by Crowd. And over the next hour, we'll discuss the latest thinking on the inner housing versus in sourcing, on the outsourcing discussion. And there are opinions beyond full time fixed employment contracts and agencies, and we'll look at some of those. Our discussions could be underpinned by findings from a new in depth report, walking the tightrope, balancing in housing and economic uncertainty. It contains research conducted with digital marketing decision makers. It will be sent to you all after this session. I'm the moderator today. My name is Brian Love Johnson. I'm the director of content at Propeller. We're a PR content and business development specialist, but more relevant to this session, a former journalist, former editor of Marketing Week magazine, and quite used to prodding and provoking panels to get some useful insights from them. I've mentioned certainly by a crowd. If it's a name that's new to you, you need to know it's a standalone specialist in housing division that gives markets a direct access to crowds, sophisticated tools, technology, and global network of two and a half thousand available digital experts. Along with the expert in housing consultants at Serpico by Crowd, that means marketers can exercise flexibility, control, and support uh, if needed when carrying out an in housing project. Now, onto the report. The insourcing versus outsourcing conversation has run for a number of years. It has been given a fresh urgency by what's happened in 2020, the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, alongside the rise of e-commerce, which was already scaling, but has also soared during this period. So, for the Walking the Tightrope report, Servico by Crowd researched the views of 213 digital marketing decision makers in the companies with turnover of 10 million or more, both in the UK and the US, and were some interesting differences. They were asked questions on their priorities, their talent needs, and their future plans based on their experience of 2020. So I'm not going to read out the whole report, it's much better for you at your leisure. But just a couple of taste of steps, 44% um, of the respondents overall plan to in-house more as a result of COVID-19, and that was 49% in the UK. Just over half the respondents in the UK said they've lost in-house talent since COVID-19 due to that mixture redundancy and furloughing and people just leaving. And the priority areas that digital marketers are likely to in-house post-COVID-19 compared to pre-pandemic are led by e-commerce and social. In fact, the UK gave more weight to social in the US to e-commerce, but they averaged it up evenly. Now, I think I've probably done enough talking and will surface some of these fascinating stats as the discussion goes on. So I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves, but first I just want to encourage everyone watching to join in and do put, submit questions or points you want to make via the chat and we'll pick them up and there will be a Q&A session at the end. So feed those in as we go along and I might pick some up as we go along. So now I'd like the panel to introduce themselves. Jerry Borman might not need any introduction, but you never know. So first of all, let's ask Jerry to tell us who he is. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Well, um, my name's Jerry Foreman. Uh, I'm chairman of Crowd, um, and previously I've worked in um, the agency um, sector for 40 years, first in full service agencies, then I had my own media agency, and then more laterally in agency groups where I ran uh, each group, PLC, and then, then Dentsu. So um, that, that's my background. I guess I've worked through five recessions, um, all of which are a little bit different, that have some commonality, dot-com boom bust, rise of digital, growth of data. So I've seen quite a bit and um, hopefully that qualifies me to uh, um, help a little bit on this panel today. Thank you. Uh, five sessions, hopefully hopefully you won't see any more, Jerry. Uh, all right, um, Jude, can you tell us Hi. about Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Jude Bridge and I'm the managing partner at Oyster Catchers. Uh, Oyster Catchers, is a, we're a consultancy and we specialise in client agency relationships. Uh, and uh, we uh, this is very topical. We advise uh, clients on their sort of optimum uh, sort of marketing ecosystem, very relevant, and uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, my background is also, I've started very much client side. So I joined Unilever as a 
grad trainee. And I think when we look at uh, Ecom, it's, it's incredible to me to think the Unilever I joined uh, would be uh, sort of really driving forward in that space. Um, so I have both client side experience and agency experience. I was also marketing comms director at uh, Marks and Spencer, uh, developed the first uh, Eurem S campaign, but also ran the in-house agency uh, there as well. So, uh, so that's me. That's a wealth of experience that called upon you. <laughs> um, okay, and last but not least, Ben, who are oh, you? Th thanks, Ramal. So I'm Ben Knight, I'm co-founder at Crowds and I'm leading Serpico, which is Crowds in-housing division. Um, my role at the business predominantly is looking after technology, tools, the platform itself and connection to our remote workforce, which is an intrinsic part of the Serpico proposition for clients. Um, my background, slightly less diverse uh, than the previous guys, where I've been in agencies since the early 2000s, so a couple of decades in agencies working across the full suite of digital um, performance channels. All right, cheers, Ben. I think we may as well get straight into it, and then let's pick up on that 44% stat that I mentioned earlier, 44% of CMOs plans in-house more as a result of COVID-19, and 49% in the UK. Uh, I guess the starting point is, is that statistic surprising to any of you? And perhaps, Joe, you might pick up first. Yeah, I guess um, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, um, you know, I'd possibly be of the view that it, it, it should be higher. Um, I think, you know, the benefits are uh, potentially very significant. When you have a very significant change uh, in a marketplace, there's always new opportunities. Um, and I think um, in-housing does give clients the opportunity to leverage the digital economy more effectively. Um, you, you know, if you look at some of the potential benefits, um, there are potential cost savings. There's also um, the ability to control more. And when you have a value chain that is shortening, uh, where uh, is more addressable and data needs protecting, um, increasingly, I think um, marketers are realizing that they need to control their own data. They need to control commerce. And therefore, they're looking at ways of doing that. Uh, and how do they find a way in which they can um, uh, capture value in a sustainable way. And I think increasingly, um, the whole picture around in-housing has changed and there are now available services and support to in-housing um, that can make a substantial uh, contribution to a sustainable um, uh, uh, aggregation of value and control. Great, hey, um, Jude, did you have a view on that 44% stat? Were you expecting to hear that stat? Yeah, I think it's that. I don't know whether it's surprising or not. I mean, I think um, I think it, you know what we've seen is uh, you know a sort of acceleration of uh, of that thinking. Um, you know, it's it's been it's we've been moving that way for some time now. And I think just to build on Jerry's point, I think what COVID's done. So you know, potentially, I think it, you might um, expect it to be higher. I think for marketeers, there's obviously the sort of cost, the control. Uh, aspects of it, but I think the opportunity uh, that marketeers are, are, are seeing, and certainly the CMOs that I talk to, is that that opportunity really to get close to uh, your customer, really to uh, sort of be able to weave your brand, you know, into you know their their lives uh, and the fabric of their of their life in a way that you know we would, we would never have thought of, say, five years ago. So I think that's the opportunity. Uh, as well as sort of the challenge that uh, that CMOs are, are, are seeing. Okay, and Ben, you know, there was a world before 2020, so do you think that stat is, is uh, as funner than if we'd asked that question a year ago and, and why? Um, I think just with the, the drives in, in the marketplace, really, the, the importance of having a, a data and first-party data strategy that you can control the, the growth to digital on a more macro level of uh, digital overtaking offline last year and forecast to grow at an even higher rates. It's such a large portion of, of the pie now that having more control, more, more transparency, you know, if we go back a few years, there were a lot more concerns about ad fraud and relevance and, and margins being taken out in the process. So I think those factors combined with 
with more of a, a channel specifics where there's more automation at the front of product development and new tools. There's a perceived um, benefit and ease to do in-house in the current climate, along with the real driving factors of having more control of your own data and owning that customer experience. Okay, I mean, I, I did mention it in the intro, uh, obviously e-commerce has, has soared during this period. Uh, I think it was accelerating before this particular period, but you know, it's taken off massively. FMCG channels could be tuning into in-house models more. I, you know, from your vantage point, Ben, what do you want to say about the FMCG e-commerce play within in-housing? Well, if we first look at e-commerce, you know, COVID, if it still says anything, is the primary place to buy is online and through digital means. So the drive to e-commerce is, is gathering pace for brands. Um, if, you, if you look at that more broadly or more specifically for FMCG, what, what it means for those advertisers, often the point of purchase or the point of sale was out of their control. And they didn't have the, the ability to connect offline data purchase to online selling. And and for SMCGs, it's a very smart move to have more control of that data, to integrate the products, the UX teams, the internal data systems, so you can be more sophisticated in how, how you advertise. So for SMCGs, it's a bit of a no-brainer, in my mind, of owning more of your own data to amplify your marketing activity more broadly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so this, this combination and, uh, of, of the, the pressures being brought about by COVID-19 changes in consumer behaviours that are already evidence. Have they made it easier to justify the argument then for in-housing capa digital capability? Um, would you say that? Um, so I, I think, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, when you have uh, recessions, and to some extent what COVID has caused is a recession, um, it tends to cause businesses to stop doing everything they can. They sort of slow everything down, cut costs. And in general, what happens is, is when the recession begins to end, marketing is one of the lead driving forces out of recession. And, uh, uh, you know, what clients need and what brands need is something different. They want something different. They're spending again. They're looking for something different that will give them a competitive advantage and an added value. And to some extent, I think um, in-housing will be very high up on the list of areas which clients will be looking at to try and get some added value, get some competitive uh, advantage. Um, and the only caveat I'll put on that is this recession is different um, because the slowdown is not uniform. It's basically a bricks and mortar recession, uh, but it's not a digital recession. So whilst many clients are cutting back, furloughing staff and um, uh, take, taking more control of their costs, there may be a bigger cost to that if they're not investing in their digital channels at the same time. So there's a different complexity around this recession, which I think um, uh, uh, clients and advertisers need, need to understand. Um, and really, you, you know, I think the main driving forces is, is that what a brand is, is fundamentally changing. If you go back to what Ben was saying about um, how, you know, media profile is changing and, and clearly uh, with digital channels now taking a, a, the majority share of ad revenue, um, uh, that's to some extent because television audiences are dissipating, they're fragmenting, they're going to streaming and um, pay-per-view services. So the old style brand advertising, create a brand, stick it through the retailers, um, you, you know, supply led, that model is fundamentally changed. It's become a demand led model. Um, and, uh, you know, effectively a brand is now much more represented by how, how it delivers a customer service. It's, you know, what is its utility? How responsive is it? How addressable are the messages that are delivered? So digital is now critical to brand building because commerce is, and how commerce responds to the consumer, how brands service their consumer is now a much bigger part of what a brand is. So all of that leads to more control, more addressability, more real time. And to do that, you've got to be able to capture the value out of one team instantaneously on a platform with the right tools, as Ben was saying, you know, those are critical elements to it. So I think it's a complicated picture, but I think those, those clients and advertisers who look at it and find a sustainable way of taking advantage of in-housing will put themselves at a competitive advantage. Even though we are in a recessionary period, I think it will come back quickly. And those that are missing out the opportunity of transforming, particularly in the commerce world, um, will pay a big price. So, you know, I think that's why it's critical. 
All right, thanks, thanks, that Jay. Do you know there's a talk about Berlin there, and, and pens are changing all the way they create themselves, and, and the way they engage with uh, potential customers is changing uh, quite rapidly. From your vantage point, you talk to a lot of brands, always captures in your big brand side yourself. Mm. Do those observations ring true? Uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the fundamental changes through COVID is, is really what, um, you know, the way that brands are, are talking to their customers. Um, and I think, um, you know, one of the, the, the sort of key things for brands is to, and the opportunity is to sort of join up that customer experience, you know, both from an e-com point of view, but from a conversational point of view uh, as well. Um, and to get, you know, the tonality right in the messaging, you know, I think, what we've seen and what, what I hear from, um, you know, the CMOs that I talk to is that there is that, that this desire from their customers for more information uh, and, you know, to, to stay connected and to be informed. Um, and they, they're looking to brands to provide that, which is why I'm sure when we talk about sort of areas to in-house, you know, really taking hold of sort of social, being able to take that data, as you say, Jerry, very, very quickly turn it into, you know, what does that mean? What do we need to communicate? And being able to sort of produce, you know, uh, messaging at volume in real time, um, you know, to keep customers sort of informed, connected uh, in the way that they're looking to brands to, to, brands to, to help them with. Okay, and Ben, any, any observations on what we're discussing here about the, the new normal and the change in consumer behaviours, making it easier to justify in-house if you wanted to take that argument to the board? Yeah, and I think making it easier is is maybe a slightly divisive comment, divisive comment because mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. The, the, the crux of, of the matter is every business has a different start and end goal. Every business has deep, different data and technology systems, different resources currently internally and a different setup. Um, I think it's more about make, making wise decisions on which part to in-house and take advantage uh, of doing that in, in the most streamlined way. Um, I think, sort of alluding to what Jerry said, the, it's a period where transformation is critically important in whatever format that comes. So it's a time to really make some sensible decisions for how to move forward. Yes, I mean, you, you say sensible, I think you could also translate that as tough. Uh, yes. Tough decisions to be made depending on budgets and, and where you are in the market and competitive set. Um, Jude first mentioned this, or I think we'll carry on with it, but the fact that uh, you know social is uh, important and obviously social and e-commerce the two top areas that um, our respondents in the research said they were looking at in housing and you know, they were joint top and below them were you know, many others like search and so forth. So does this align with what you're all seeing from your vantage point, e-commerce and social as the in-housing areas that are most being explored and looked at and, and I'll stay with you kind of guess to start with anyway because you're probably supposed to be around on that. Um, from, from my side for sure like aspirationally there's a lot of sense in owning your e-commerce strategy, connecting all the internal data and where, where required, and often this is required, getting expertise into support with that transition. Um, I think e-commerce, if you take something like Amazon, it's a very contained uh, channel. There's not, so, there's not a huge number of different platforms to understand and get your head around. So in a lot of ways, it's less of a connected experience and therefore maybe slightly simpler to in-house. Um, the paid social is a, a key recipient um, of where eyeballs are, particularly during COVID, and it's taking a large market share of eyeballs. So owning that experience and connecting to deliver the right customer experience is, is very, very possible and very important to clients. So you can see why they want to, touching on what you said, own the messaging and the control. Um, the, key to, the key to both of those is, how are you structured internally? How are you set up? How does your data work? And how do you need to use that data? And, and can you get that data to make the most of your advertising? So yes, crudely, but every business is very different. And we are getting clients coming to us from all avenues of digital, looking to in-house, not only the entirety, but specific channels across the board. So it's not a, it's not, not everyone is very focused on just those channels. It's often much more broad. 
Okay, it's, it's, it's nuances out there. Um, yeah. Jerry, Jerry um, what advice would you actually have for marketers who were kind of starting with um, well, not knowing where to start, shall we say, and considering which elements to in-house, what should they take into consideration when they're looking to prioritize? Yeah, you know, I think, I think the first thing to say, you know, around the e-commerce and, and social being popular, if you were to ask any business um, whether their reputation and revenue are important to control, they'd all say yes. And, and effectively, social is reputation and, and e-commerce is revenue. So, you know, it's kind of fairly obvious that they want to control their reputation and their revenue. So I think, uh, you know, that doesn't surprise me in that regard. And, and I think it makes a huge amount of sense. I think in terms of, you know, where do they start? Um, I think the first thing to say is, even if you don't think you're going to do in-housing, you need to be investigating it now. You need to be planning now because it takes time to execute it properly. And you need to be looking at what, what works best on a case-by-case -case basis for your business, where you can add value quickly. Um, what do you do well at the moment? What is more challenging to deliver? And it takes a little bit of work to do that. Um, you, you know, uh, my, my colleague on the on the right of the screen, uh, Ben, will be you know more than happy to help in that regard. But I think there does need some prep work, even if you don't think you're going to do it. I think the second thing is that um, you know within a lot of businesses, marketing uh, can be seen as a little bit out on the side. Um, uh, you know, not in all of them. You know, it can be very important for some businesses. Um, but uh, you know, now marketing is more about direct revenue. You're getting marketers being called chief revenue officers. They're moving much more central. They're much more important in the organization. And I think accordingly, when you have in-housing, sometimes you bring in these experts uh, from agencies and from outside who are slightly different animals. They've got a different experience. They're different type of people. And it's very important that they become part of the central culture of the company. They have to be included in the culture. And therefore, the culture and the, you know, the vision for the business and the values that that company holds needs to incorporate the different types and broader ranges of talent that you may get if you're in housing. Um, so I think that's a really important part to think about where do those people fit in? Because, you know, hitherto, quite a lot of people have gone to age, gone from agencies to advertisers to in-house and they're kind of lonely um, and they're not seen as that central. Oh, you're the guy in the corner who's good at that bit. You know, that's just been the case and they just leave. Uh, and that still has been an issue. So I think the cultural piece is critical. Um, uh, um, understanding how important it is for the business, but also understanding who do you need in house, and actually who you know who do you need on a distributed worker basis. I mean, I mean uh, we haven't talked much about crowdies, but they are distributed workers, thousands of them, who are very flexible and can really add a lot of value um, in a very flexible way. You know, you can use that resource when you need it. When you don't need it, you can turn it off. So, what resource do you actually need? outside but on your internal platform what resource you need internally and how do you make them central to the organization and then make sure you're planning and investigating because um, that's a critical way to discern which elements and which services you might use all right thanks for that um do, do just want to see if you have anything to say about where what we should take into consideration when you're looking what to prioritize uh in regards to in housing doesn't matter what you're in housing but what you know, how you approach the kind of mental process well i think you, you know you, it has to be sort of rooted in your sort of business ob business objectives you know your, your you know your marketing strategy um you know i think it, you know don't put cart before horse i think i think it says in the report you know don't jump to solution you know if, if that's the answer what's the real question make sure that you're you know asking the right questions and i think for most marketeers as i say the prize is to be able to you know, uh, sort of join up all those channels uh, to really kind of, um, I think, sort of service customer, you know, sort of classic marketing of servicing customer needs, you know, right message, right time, right place. And if that's the sort of goal, then you can sort of start, start from there rather than sort of starting with the kind of what capabilities do we have? I mean, obviously there, you know, we'll talk about the sort of financial implications. There are obvious um you know, uh, questions around, um, you know, the acceleration of, of, of in-housing, but, you know, particularly, and the guys, Ben and Jerry, would 
Ed would be able to try to say that without mentioning ice cream, by the way. Um, it's sponsored by Ben and Jerry. Ben and Jerry, yes. And, uh, but, but, you know, what can you in-house? What should you in-house? What are the sort of capabilities that you need to really make the difference uh, to that sort of customer journey? Uh, and then what's the sort of appetite in the organisation uh, for, you know, investment in the tech? You know, will you be able to keep pace with that, you know, in the same way that, you know, outsourcing it uh, would, would allow you to do. Do you have that investment, um, you know, sort of bandwidth? So that, so it's all those sort of, it's, it's very, you know, it's a complicated set of questions I think you have to ask yourself um, and businesses are asking themselves. I think particularly, you know, as the, we talk about, um, you know, the, the sort of new normal, but I, I don't think any of us believe we're anywhere near that yet. Uh, and certainly in terms of sort of the customer, you know, those journeys have been so disrupted. You know, CMO said to me the other day, the main challenge for me as a leader has been having to unlearn everything I've known and effectively sort of start that all over again. So, you know, I think it is about really trying to be clear, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Um, where are you now? What are the things that you can do now? And what's the roadmap? And I think that's what uh, sort of Jerry talked about. What's the roadmap to get to you to where you you think you need to be? I, I think that that's really fundamental as a point. Is is that what is your starting point and what's your end objective here? How does that tie into your business planning? And actually, what are your capabilities for achieving that in the short, medium, long terms? And then also really fundamentally. Do you have the support from your CPO, your, your, your operations team, your data team? Are they all bought into this? Because every team and department needs to be connected at the hip to achieve the best uh, in-housing strategy. And you need a clear plan to deliver on that. And, and you, you, there's no such thing as over planning an in-housing journey because there's a lot of complexity to it. I think the thing to add to that is, it, you know, it's not you talk about it's not a it's not really a bi necessarily just a binary decision. You know, what do you do in house? What is the role for uh, for 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 external partners? Um, and I think you know, whilst we've sort of talked about the the need for brands to really own their data, which they do, and to get the value from it, it's also about sort of keeping that freshness in terms of you know inspiration into the business. Uh, external, you know, uh, sort of, uh, say, sort of um, provocation to, to really challenge, uh, to, to keep that keep that challenge, which is what really makes sort of, um, you know, I think sort of marketeers uh, sort of really drive that growth. Okay, no, that all makes a lot of sense. And you have to, as you say, uh, the marketers has to ask themselves a number of questions before they you know, approach implementing anything. Um, speaking of questions for the audience, please do type some questions into the chat box. This is a great opportunity to be the brains of a fine panel. So do start thinking about what you might want to ask and what points you might want to raise and stuff a little bit later. Um, I'd like to move the discussion on to talent because nothing happens without the talent. Uh, there are no capabilities without the talent that the people who do jobs. Um, one of the key challenges that emerged from Surfico Research was around finding the right talent to build in house teams. And it's a particular challenge for smaller companies, 43% of respondents in companies with a turnover of 10 million to 50 million. So it was a main barrier to in-housing and I can find the talent. Uh, at the same time, if we take into account the circumstances we're in, 51% of respondents had lost talent due to redundancy, furlough or staff quitting during the pandemic. Um, there's an extra little wrinkle to these stats that way. Deloitte brought out their latest global marketing trends report recently which said that 77% of CMOs have turned to AI to automate work during the pandemic, but only a small portion, about 6%, have tapped the gig economy, which is what we've been talking about in distributed workforce. So that potential of the um, distributed workforce is still to be explored by a large amount of businesses. But staying with the talent, you know, it, it's, um, it's a tough one, but what are the solutions if you're losing talent because you've been forced to or they decide to quit on their own anyway, fair? Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question really. So I think what the research is backed up really nicely is, you know, the larger the company, the more famous, maybe even the more exciting the business, the easier it is to recruit great talent. 
but still, you know, just under half of those businesses were saying it's still a big struggle. Um, get, getting slightly down the scale, it was, you know, a huge amount of businesses struggled to recruit the right talent at an even lower level. So it, it's, a, it's a difficult one to answer in a very succinct way, but there is this cultural piece, the point Jerry mentioned about being included and part of it, having ownership, um, all working towards common goals, this clear objectives, framework, you know, and in the world where everyone's remote, it's even harder to sometimes get that cultural vibe into a business. Um, for, for our agency business, it's, you know, we've, we've got a, a, a great agency business and we've got, you know, thousands of remote workers or distributed workforce that we tap into to support our team and deliver the skill sets that we can't produce or haven't got enough of to do internally. And I think it's just the same flow. It's having a more dynamic way of working um, is, is one for the future. And I think it's a really key thing for brands to think about when they look to go through a period of transformation or reinvention. Okay, and um, Jerry, you know, on the talent tip, um, you know, identifying talent, attracting it, retaining it, how has things changed uh, apart from how we the budgets to do it in the past 12 months? Yeah, so I think I think it's about um, it, it's a lot of it's about that cultural piece that if you hire people that they have to feel that number one they're coming to work at that company, and number two they have a role within that. So what does that mean for them? But I think also if a lot of the deep specialisations can be if you like um, outsourced on an internal platform to uh, distributed workers, then that's a model that I think can work really really well. And and I think what we've seen is with people working at home. Um, you've seen that it is workable, but of course that's an accidental working at home. So the you know the ways in which you manage culture with people working from home isn't particularly sophisticated. Also, these people have worked in the office before. Now, when you have crowdies, they've never worked in the office. They've always been distributed workers, and in fact, a huge amount of the effort that crowd does is to maintain the culture and to support those distributed workers in the right way. So in an environment where you will have an in-housing strategy with a platform, say like a Serpico, which needs to be managed by the right talent internally, that needs to be fully engaged in the business and given the right career opportunities, then the distributed workers, so in this case, the crowdies, will receive the same sort of cultural um, encouragement to be part of the team, the internal team, um, as they currently are, um, in, in their distributed working environment as, as crowdies. So it's more sophisticated, it's more complicated, but I think a lot of clients will have more confidence that distributed workers could work if you have the right focus on culture, if you have the right platform, if you have a sustainable um, strategy around in-housing that is fundamental to the success of the business, then it can be achievable. It's a bit more complicated, but I think there'll be a lot more confidence out there that that can be managed. So for me, it's put the right focus on the right pe pe people in terms of the management capability internally, and then outsource on an internal platform through distributed workers uh, to, to uh, uh, deep specialists. And I think that can work. Um, uh, and, you know, in a sense, where in-housing has failed before is because there's no R&D on the, on, the, on the practice, the actual specialist practice. So one of the reasons people leave is A, because they don't really feel part of the company, but B, because their capabilities decaying too. They're not learning, they're not developing. Whereas if you have a platform like, like a Serpico, if, if you like, you in-house all the benefits, but you outsource the R&D. And that I think makes it sustainable and that enable you to maintain and retain better talent as a consequence. Okay, I mean, we've mentioned the, the, the culture word now quite a, quite a lot, uh, and I was gonna move on to an actual uh, respondent stats on that. Um, 34% of respondents said the ability to scale to an extended team is a barrier to in-housing to the large organisations, which is similar to what you've addressed already, Jerry, but there is this, this fear, essentially, that you can't scale your very precious company culture, which quite often is what you're selling as a business uh, with an extended team, um, especially in the situation we're in. Anything else we can add to that? kind of um, solution basically to be able to scale company culture to an extended team. Jude, have you seen this in operation anywhere? Have you worked in this kind of scenario? Well, I mean, I think we're all in a very diff 
you know, very new new scenario with them, um, with, with everybody working from home. But, you know, I think what we've seen is just how quickly people adapt and sort of reform into, you know, you know, their, their own um, sort of working culture. And I think particularly where you've got, um, you know, in, when we talk about in-house, you know, often that's an in-house team augmented by, you know, agency, uh, you know, teams who bring part of that sort of culture as well. And I think what we've seen is that is teams, uh, you know, feeling sort of empowered to create that culture, whether that's sort of just in the moment, um, but, but that, that, you know, kind of diffuses out um, because I think you're getting more and more um, uh, so, sort of people involved from other parts of the organisation, just thinking about, uh, you know, before COVID, you know, product development are, are brought into, uh, into the, that sort of um, development process much more regularly now. Um, so you have, you know, brand, you have marketing, you have UX, you have uh, product developers in there, all of whom kind of bring those different skills um, and different sort of ways, different sort of um, perspectives on things. And that does sort of, uh, you know, that is building the culture, but cultures evolve. They evolve with circumstances. They evolve, um, you know, with, with, with the skills and, and, and mindsets of, of those involved. So, you know, I think, I think as Jerry said, it's harder, it's harder to build that. Um, but, you know, I think what we've seen is, um, you know, that resilience and, um, you know, that, that, desire to be part of something I think and, and, and if you've got that north star um, you know I think that that really helps. Mm, well I mean you, you've mentioned that uh, it's so hard to say, kind of maintain it which we don't want a, an ossifying culture either do you? you don't want a culture that fossilizes yeah um, which is a question we've already touched on but I'm going to bring it back up again and it's been raised by uh, John King from the audience Agencies work with lots of other lot of different sectors and clients, which helps us fertilize the learnings and drive innovation. And then when a client employs an agency, it brings all that knowledge from several sectors and work with lots of different projects in. You know, how can an in-house team keep up to date market developments and new thinking um, you know, when they're not getting that level of exposure themselves? And that goes all the way up the tree, you know, to the top senior levels as well. Um, Okay. What, what would you respond to that? Um, it, it's a really good question, actually. So I, I would say a, a lot of the, the briefs over the last year when speaking to clients about their in-housing requirements, one of the number one fundamental points is we want to in-house this part of digital or this entire system, but we want to be kept at the cutting edge and we need support. We want a hybrid model, even if, even if we're fully in-housed on channel operations. Mm -hmm. We want that great centralized planning function that agencies are what renowned for, because key really is, is understanding the data and the connection points for those channels so you can deliver a great customer experience. It's having all those connections, and it's also gaining that expertise where you know, in an agency, you have 100 clients, you're testing new things on a daily basis and you're spreading those learnings. At a one client team, you have to keep cutting edge, you have to be learning new things. And often as it comes in the form of a hybrid model of in-housing. Um, training is, is obviously a key part of the in-housing solution for clients, uh, be it in, in just a, a data piece or, or wider specific channel operations. But training is a fundamental thing we try and run with clients to help raise their capabilities and their knowledge so they they know what's what's new and what's hot and what's working and and also what they should be planning for not just this year but the following year and where do you need to be with your data so you can make the best decisions on customer experience for a business and ultimately maintain your competitive advantage that's an interesting point yes obviously uh, training uh, ex external training capabilities it can be keep the in-house team sharp and on their, on their toes. Jerry, anything to add to that at all about keeping that freshness on the inside? On the inside? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think one sector to look at that in a, for slightly different reasons is in-house for quite a long while has been the luxury sector. If you look at a lot of luxury, they in-house their creativity, they keep a lot of control because their brand is everything. And if they compromise their brand at all, then they're losing a huge amount of value. Uh, and I think um, some of the, the culture of brand in luxury is extremely useful to learn from in relation to in-housing in other sectors, where hitherto you wouldn't have said it was entirely relevant, but I think um, it, it really, really is. 
Um, and, and I think, you, you know, um, uh, as we've said, keeping that culture uh, aligned is, is critical to its, its success. Um, but I think, you know, also fundamentally, it's about taking a long term view. Is our first party data important to us? If it is, start from that because you've got to control it. And if you've got to control it, then, you know, that leads to uh, a different approach. I think as Jude was saying earlier, you've got to start with a strategic approach and then see what fits in around that strategic approach. What's important to you? What's important to your brand? What's important to uh, the business? Is your data important, controlling your revenue? Uh, and, and, you know, as we move more and more to the segment of one, where every single interface with a consumer is almost personalized to them, much more addressable, um, that's going to add value to your position as brand, as a service, your, you know, your customer experiences, everything to do with your brand. You know, if those things are important, then this is a journey you have to go on and you have to go on it carefully and do it in the right way. Um, but, but I think all of the, the points that both Ben and Jude have made are really relevant to how to execute that. Okay, well, just, sorry, just an additional point on that. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of sort of driving innovation, the, 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 the sort of slight danger within housing, um, you know, and, and there are various different uh, versions of it, most in housing, when we talk about it, you know, has, has an element of, of external resource either plugged in or or augmenting it is just to keep getting that outside stimulus that that extra you know um uh, sort of sense you know enriching that first party data with uh you know whether it's uh, you know sort of cultural reference um and i think that's sort of the role that you know agencies still play key part for their clients in you know whatever in-house model you have you know that's i think where agencies Ben talked about that you know the planning function um in agencies being but it's it's that constant sort of curiosity about you know this is our situation but what what else is going on in the wider world that can inform that and and that I think is where you create that sort of richer uh, sort of brand uh, brand um sort of sort of role really but that's the value of using external uh, support sure. yeah. to bring that uh, richness in um, one of the biggest barriers, of course, which we're now going to move on to, is the financial barrier uh, to in housing. Um, you know, unsurprisingly, in the current climate, some sectors are struggling. Everyone's operating in a recession-type circumstance, um, and the potential for more budget cuts in the future was cited as a barrier to in housing by 38% of respondents. You know, people are worried you know, more budget cuts are coming. So, how does in housing? proof itself against that concern of potentially more budget cuts coming. Um, have you got any advice, uh, Joe? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, everything you do has to have, uh, you know, clarity around short, medium and long-term returns on what you're doing. And if the project to in-house uh, provides, you know, some upfront cost to do that, just in terms of resourcing, then you've got to be clear about what you're going to capture from that and, and execute rigorously around that. Um, I think, you know, to some extent, the whole idea of in-housing to get control, but also to get more flexible resource, is going to have a cost advantage to you down the line. It's going to give you a competitive advantage. What's the value of that? Quantify that. But it's going to give you a cost advantage too. And I think it's just about crystallizing some real targets around that and being accountable on how to deliver against that. Um, you know, the very best ideas will work and will deliver, but you've got to own them and you've got to own the number. And you've got to own, you know, where you're going to take that business. And I think that to some extent requires a little bit of courage from marketing directors to say, I can think this through, I can work on a plan and this should be, give us more control, more accessibility to consumers. Um, nowadays we can access that talent and capability externally that agencies continue to provide, but we can do this in a much more cost-effective way, a more flexible way. But that's, you know, that plan then has to be owned. So I think, um, you know, there is a, a cost issue, uh, but like you know, anything that's worth having, it's going to take a bit of effort to get there. Um, and it requires a bit of courage and a bit of ownership to do that. But um, uh, I think I'm pretty convinced that the sort of hybrid model that Ben talked about uh, and that Jude talked about as well is, is a critical way to go forward to access far more talent, more cost effectively um, uh, in a way that will continue to develop um, and keep you competitive, but give you control, give you greater proximity to the consumer uh, and advance you along the uh, digital economy uh, uh, channel that will maintain the competitiveness of your business. So uh, I think 
it's just going to take a little bit of courage and some proper planning and owning the number. All right, uh, I'm going to move that same question over to Ben, but just again, just to remind the audience as we move into the last 10 minutes, do ask a question if you've got something burning on your mind, put it in the chat box or the Q&A box. Uh, but Ben, can you pick up on that uh, budget cuts perceived as the biggest barrier to inner housing and, and how can you uh, proof yourself against the concern? Yeah, I, I think if, if I go back to when we set up Crowd, so nearly a decade ago, it was um, very insightful planning or very fortuitous in the current climate. But we, we launched a business which was our in-agency team or in-house teams that were supercharged by a distributed workforce. You know, the gig economy as a term didn't exist then, but it was the natural avenue so we could actually scale up and demand down as required on demand at the right times and so for us that that business model has been fundamental to our thinking for the last 10 years i appreciate in, in current climate it's becoming more and more interesting as an avenue for clients but it's something we've been harnessing for 10 years and making work and building technology to allow that functionality but the ability to scale gives you a lot more options in how you do this so we had a piece of work where we were estimating a client would need to in-house about 20 people to fulfill their aspirations for digital in-housing. But actually in, in the budget constraints, what they, what they can do through our, through our model is get a team of five or six and you plug into the sources they need. And you know, it was very obvious the client would need 20 hours a month of creative for, and they'd need another 20 hours to produce dynamic creative and tagging for those elements. And they just choose to use the crowdy model to fulfill on that. So you can in-house much more strategically, much more of a risk theory method by using something as a, a distributed workforce. And that's, that's really the key for how our business works. It's plugging those gaps in when we need them um, through specialists. And I, I think that that's a really important thing when there is pressure on budget cuts in the future to have the key talent you absolutely need internally um, and then use distributed workforce to, to fulfill the rest. Okay, um, you know, let, let's, let's cut to a little bit of a chase then. Does in-housing really save a company money in the long run or to make it save you money in the long run, what have you, have you kind of built into that? Um, Jude, have you got any thoughts from your best experience about does in-housing really save a company money in the long run or how do you make it ensure that it saves you money in the long run? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think um, I think done well. Um, you know that there there are there are uh, definite sort of case studies. You know, if you look at people like P and G, they've been able to sort of identify, you know, uh, significant um, uh, sort of efficiencies uh, in, in in their model. Um, and um, I think it's you know I think it's about sort of um, you, you've got to be able to measure that. We haven't talked about measurement. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's really important to sort of put that um, that that in place. Um, but yeah, I think sort of if you do it well, um, you know, if you think about, if you use your data wisely, if you know the right time to intervene, um, you know, the right uh, frequency uh, to um, sort of interact with your customers, you know, you're, you're just in terms of wastage. Uh, if you like, then, um, you know, there's, there's obviously um, sort of efficiencies to be had there. I think, you know, Ben would be better placed to talk about it uh, than I. I think there's some sort of bear traps in terms of the investment in tech and, and, the, and, the, and the sort of tech that you, um, uh, that, that you put in place. And that's always an area that, um, you know, you should really make sure you get best advice on, on what's the right, um, the right solution for you. But, um, you know, I, I think it's... Um, in, in many ways, it's sort of unarguable that there will the logic of, of getting those efficiencies, but it is about making, you know, all the channels uh, that you're operating in uh, kind of join up. And, you know, I think that the CMO's role in, in many ways is, is turning into that, of, you know, con, con, if it, it may always have been, you know, about conducting that orchestra to make sure that it's sort of, you know, finely tuned uh, and you know, working in harmony, and that's where you get the efficiencies. Okay, um, I'm going to jump into a kind of quick fire round now. Some questions have come in. Uh, um, good question. This one: At what point do, you, what, what point in the efforts of an in-housing project do 
you realise it might not be the right option. You know, what, what are the red flags that in housing isn't working for your business? Because your concept's going to work for every business. So, what should you be watching for? So, you can waste more resource and more investment. Ben, anything you can pick up there? Yeah. So, the the sort of our, our overview is don't, don't try and boil the ocean. Take it in segments. Key planning, auditing, benchmarking understanding where you currently lie and what your structure is, and then have a measured plan for this is what I need to achieve by then to tick off that this is working. Um, I've heard um, many case studies out where in-housing has failed as a, as a strategy, but often it's not having the right resource and talent to ensure that it didn't fail. Um, but having a clear plan with clear measures um, that you can benchmark and record those KPIs that are all important. What where have you got on? There may be a short burst of higher cost and a much more um, functional, cost-effective solution in the future. But you, you just need to have your KPIs determined at the start and have buy-in across the entire business of what you're trying to achieve and what you need to do by when to achieve on it. Um, I, I can't think of a, a case where it's been a disaster. Um, I think it's just been some bad decisions made and not the clear measures of what you need to sort of organize yourself to, to achieve along that route. So um, just clear plan, clear measurement, clear reporting, uh, and the right team to deliver on it. Okay, I mean, I've certainly seen companies reverse the decision. Yes. Companies as well, uh, but, but not privy to what we've got inside. Uh, Jerry, anything to add to that about what are the red flags you should be watching for as you do an in-housing project that might say, put the brakes on, stand back or even reverse? I think not not specifically, except to say that in all projects like this, you need to have a you know you have need to have a rigorous plan. You have to have a timeline, and you have to have landmark performance metrics, and and you have to have a plan that says if we don't get here by then, um, how long do we carry on for before we revert? And if you have if you like your exit plan as well as a backup, then get everyone to buy into what the plan is and just and just um, stick to it. So if you're performing in the right way against your timelines. Um, then, you know, if it isn't delivering the performance you need, for whatever reason, you know at which point you have to revert and, and go back and maybe start again a little bit later. But, it, you know, if you plan it properly, you should see that coming before it happens. That shouldn't make it too costly for you. Um, I think that's really the only advice I can give. And, and you know, project management is not, is not always a, uh, a great skill. It's a skill that's really needed um, in more businesses and will particularly be relevant here. Okay, thanks for that. Um, another question that's coming from the audience. Uh, we did mention automation earlier when I, I referred to the, uh, the report earlier. Um, has automation enabled the shift towards in-housing or is there still a need for man hours, which could be a barrier to in-housing, whether you consider man hours a barrier or not? Uh, has automation helped the shift towards in-housing for ultimately for certain processes, certain functionalities? Yeah. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, automation and um, often the perception that it's easier to run a performance channel because of all the automation involved means that you need less skill sets in, internally. Um, I think that's a key driver, but in the, re in the reality of the situation, you need great account structures and setup. You need the right creative, the right messaging, the right data, the right audience structure to allow automation to be effective. So you need a, an experienced brain controlling the automation to make it work most effectively. So although it's a driver for shifting this along with first party data, um, it's, it's often a, seen as it can do more than it can for delivery of results without the right controls, the right expertise controlling that automation. Okay, and, and on the man hours, where do you, you know, where do we still see a need for that kind of intense person hours, I'm going to call it? Person yeah. hours being input. Yeah, so I, I think the, the big point on this is you, you can use um, automation to take away a lot of the manual um, work from, 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 and what you want to do as a, as a person overseeing this is be more strategic, do more testing, make more of your data and your audiences to deliver better performance. And you want to act more strategically in how you manage it. And you can give, let automation take up a lot of the slack of the, of the doing, but you still need that, that key talent, uh, which takes a lot of man hours to achieve. So 
I, I wouldn't say it's a reduction in man hours. It's a re it's a change in the type of hours you you require um, to actually deliver sort of the KPIs and ROIs for for the business. Okay, um, the hour has flown past, I have to say, um, and we're into the final few minutes. I was going to ask each member of the panel for their final takeaway or piece of advice for any marketer looking at beginning an in-housing journey. Um, Jude, what would be your, your final takeaway or piece of advice? Um, I think for marketeers, you know, keep the customer absolutely at the heart of what you're doing um, and have a clear strategy of where you want to get to um, in terms of your, you know, relationship and interaction with them. You know, really define, I think, what are the core capabilities you need to have in-house uh, in your own team and, you know, what can you augment uh, with external uh, resource. And I think it really is also about keeping that freshness, you know, that, that kind of helps evolve the culture by having that sort of outside in uh, inspiration, provocation and, and challenge. Those would be my sort of key key points. Okay, Jerry, your final kind of summing up of what you need to bear in mind and the advice. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, plan it properly. If you're not, if you're not sure, investigate. Um, uh, do do your homework beforehand. As I said, this recession is is a bifurcated recession. It's not a recession in the digital economy. It's a it's a you know it's a growth period, and therefore you know it takes the right frame of mind to say we need to be taking advantage of this. Um, I think in housing can benefit every company in some way, um, and it's about understanding what benefits your business in the right way. Uh, and I think, as Ben said earlier, to make sure uh, you don't try and boil the ocean and you do. You do the right bits at the right time, but plan properly, investigate, get advice from experts and get the best combination of internal control, getting the value uh, and getting the external resource that supports it. So um, I think that's that's how I would advise to start. Okay, that's a great summation. And uh, ben, anything to add on top of that? Uh, I think they've both done very good summaries of uh, sort of what, what I would suggest as well. It's, it's understanding the you know, the business aspirations and having cohesive buy-in from all the key areas of the business. So you're all aligned on the journey. And then once you've done the auditing and the benchmarking, have a clear plan with clear measures so you can track success from it. And in, and don't be scared of, of getting external support on the planning stage because often external eyes will give you much clearer insight into what you need. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I think the panellists, Jay, June and Ben, deserve a virtual round of applause from everybody watching. They've given plenty of insights, plenty of shared knowledge that we I hope you can take away, think about and you will find useful. The report I've mentioned, Walking the Tightrope, will be sent to you shortly. And you can also find it at insight.servico.io forward slash report as well. But it's going to be sent to you. Good readings. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending and thank you again to the panel.